Greetings, Ohio Valley. This is Dan Lima with OSU Extension from Belmont County. And this is Karen Cox from WVU Extension in Ohio County. Thanks for tuning in to Extension Calling, your source for research-based information for the farm, garden, and home. All right. How are you doing, Karen? Oh, you know, a little stressed. Um, Got family down in Fort Myers area. Yeah. They're okay. They don't have power, but they're not underwater. They're not near the beach area. Well, and honestly, the rain amounts they were predicting down there uh, and both 20 plus inches of rain, you know, not to mention like, what is it called when uh, the ocean kind of comes in on top of that and creates all that flooding? Yeah, storm surge is dangerous. It's just devastating. They said, what, it's like the worst storm they've seen in 100 years in mainland Florida? Unfortunately, the the weather equipment broke, <laughs> so they're not exactly sure how bad it got. I think the depth gauge broke at 7 feet, and they were expecting a 12-foot surge, which is really big. For those of you who aren't familiar with hurricanes and what they normally do, a 12-foot storm surge is outrageous. I mean, I don't think you have to be there to understand that a 12-foot increase in water (laughs) is is going to be very damaging catastrophe. Yeah, I saw some pictures and it just, it's amazing how much damage occurred. And it occurred all across the state. I mean hurricanes will spawn tornadoes so on the outer rings of the hurricane you also have tornado damage so you have flooding tornadoes and the hurricane which had some seriously high wind speeds oh yeah they i think they said some numbers like 150 miles an hour which is outrageous yeah and even through the night they were sustained over 30 miles an hour so yeah <laughs> Well, it's, you see the pictures coming back and just entire cities underwater, oh, yeah. roofs ripped off and bridges moved. Uh, it's it's going to take a lot to get to get back from that. It is. Yeah. And, you know, and those little islands out there, Sanibel, Captiva, those are called barrier reefs and they're called that for a reason. They took the brunt of it, as they always do. And the last one that hit that area was Hurricane Charlie, which was back in, I want to say, 89. Yeah, and it's hit the East Coast all the way up the coast. Yeah, and we'll probably get some rain from it here, too. Oh, yeah, we'll get rain, but (laughs) I don't think we'll... Yeah, we won't get a storm surge, but we might get some flooding (laughs) associated with this hurricane. It It wouldn't be fair to compare. Yeah, but um, we did do a program on flood preparation what two three weeks ago so if you wanted to check back and look through the podcast and find that to help you get your property and your farm prepared for any upcoming rain or flood events i encourage you to do that today we wanted to talk a little bit more about what comes after the storm so if you have experienced flooding what are some of the things you need to be aware of how do you recover What are the first steps? So, of course, the first step is to let your family know you're okay. (laughs) We always appreciate that. Thankfully, my family is all good. They are safe, even though they don't have power and have no idea when they'll have power again. But yeah, along with checking, checking in with your family, check in with your neighbors too. go over there and see if they're okay. Yeah, definitely. The second thing to do is to reach out to FEMA. They are going to be the ones coordinating assistance in the area. I mean, if you're in danger, obviously call 911 and let them know where you are and what your danger is. But then once you're ready to start, like, you know, getting beyond the life threatening stages, then call FEMA and find out what's going on in the area. And just don't pick up any lines that are down. Don't try to move anything because you don't know what's under something, what's uh, what might slip and come down and fall. Everything's going to be very, um, what do I want to say? Unsta- unstable. Unstable. Yeah. Yeah, and, and for just, sure. Just be extra aware, you know, check in with your family, check in on your neighbors. Obviously, call 911 if there's an emergency. 
but also recognize they may not be able to get to you. And when they do call for evacuations, it is for a reason. And I know having lived in Florida, that maybe you don't always pay attention to that. And there's multiple reasons people don't evacuate. Um, Some of them are financial. A lot of them are about pets or maybe that's just hard for them to move. They have special equipment they need or whatever. So there's a lot of reasons and I understand that. But recognize that emergency responders may not be able to get to you or at least not for a little while. So do your best to protect yourself, protect your family, and protect your livestock too. Right. In a storm like that, it doesn't, you know, normally we think of first responders and emergency response as something very localized. You know, an event happens and it can respond to it. When it's something like this, it's everywhere. And I just don't see how they could possibly respond to everybody as fast as they normally would because everybody's going to need help. And I think everything's going to be stretched so thin, it's going to be tough and you have to be patient. But also on top of that, make sure you're communicating everything to 911 so they can prioritize calls and make sure that they do the best they can with the time they have. And be patient with them. You know, they are under a lot of stress too. Your emergency responders are doing everything they can. And they lost some equipment and such too. You know, I saw pictures in Naples where fire trucks were underwater. I guess I saw that. So <laughs> they can't really respond right away. And they're probably going to ask for a lot of information. So the more they have, the better they can respond. So yeah, be patient, as Karen said, and give them as much information as you can. And so another thing you can do is not cause undue emergencies. So if you are outside, um, stay out of the water if you can, especially if you see downed power lines. Um, electricity travels very well through water. So make sure you're staying away from that, especially when they actually start to restore the power. Typically, they connect it line to line, but... There's always that possibility that one of those down lines does have power in it. So never touch a down line. Make sure you're reporting them to the power company. Now, I don't want everyone to call the power company right after a storm. But, you know, if you live further down a lane and might have a little bit of extra information other than all the lines are down, that can be helpful to power companies in restoring power. Or if you suspect a live wire. Yeah, or if you suspect a live wire, for sure. Also, keep in mind the number one injury following any type of flood event is foot injury. So people stepping on things that they couldn't see under the water. Never walk around barefoot. Flip-flops are not your friends. Get yourself a good sturdy pair of boots, rubber boots. If you've got galoshes you can put over your boots, that's even better. As high as they can go. Make sure you're wearing long pants, long sleeves, gloves, because that's some dirty water you're walking through. And there's some sharp objects that you might be that might be floating in there. You don't want to get cut in a situation like that. Yeah, and there's sewage floating in there. There's random bits of metal that are probably rusty. So there's a tetanus danger. Make sure you're up on your tetanus shot. Oh yeah. There's fuels. Fuels, yeah. Pesticides. Oh, yeah. So you have to be careful. If you don't have clean water to wash things in, that's going to make it a little bit more dangerous. So if you have a wound, use the clean bottled water that you have to clean that out. But also recognize that it may be a little while before you get more clean water. So be sparing with it. Maybe take a couple days before you start cleaning stuff up just to make sure that you have access to clean water and medical equipment to clean any cuts and wounds that may occur during the cleanup. Yeah, just just keep your eye on it. You know, it, just realize also that it's a dirty environment. You might want to take a little extra precaution, but obviously look for signs of swelling later. Like if it stays really hot, it might be infected. And wear shoes, wear boots if you have them, wear pants, um, don't be out in shorts. Um, long sleeve, make sure you're wearing gloves when you're moving stuff. Right. Yeah. And so 
some of the things that you may want to pay attention to are your flooring, carpet and padding is done. It's not going to be able to dry out while it is on the floor. So you're going to want to remove that as quickly as possible. Wood floors may be salvageable. Like if you have one that curves and pops out, just pull that plank off, let it dry. It may flatten out, but it's much easier to replace one plank than the whole floor. Um, So do your best to get some fans. If you have power or generator, start trying to get some air moving through the area before mold can set in. You really want to do your best to prevent mold from starting. If you have serious flooding, the sheetrock or drywall inside, it acts like a sponge as well as any insulation in your walls. So you're going to want to cut it at least three feet above the water line and remove any insulation because, like I said, it acts like a sponge. It just sucks it straight up. Yeah, that's right. And not only goes for flooding, but even if you have a leaky window that's kind of going behind the walls, remove all the moldy insulation that's in there. You might have to add new wood in there just for support. When you're when you're in there, you'll be able to see, you know, what's salvageable, what's not. Yeah. And when you're looking at getting things dried quickly, even something as simple as removing the molding along the floor can help the walls and the floor dry a little faster because it opens up that air vent to allow air to get down behind and under. And again, we're trying to prevent mold, but you're still going to want to clean stuff. So because, you know, we mentioned that the waters were contaminated with who knows what. Um, So hopefully you have some bleach on hand that it was in your emergency kit. If you don't have bleach at your house now and you may be in a flood condition, potentially, make sure you go get some and just keep it in your emergency kit. It does expire, so you have to rotate it out occasionally. It's not like it goes bad. It just gets less potent. So if you have old bleach, maybe use a little bit more. But it's really hard to tell exactly how strong it is unless you have some indicator strips like we use for food safety to tell you how much bleach is in the water. But to clean the area, you're going to want to mix one quarter cup of bleach to a gallon of water to prevent mold. So you're going to wipe anything that got wet and clean that stuff up. For toys and such like that, one cup of bleach to five gallons of water, wash them off and let them air dry. Stuffed animals and things like that, those are going to be really tough because you can't really clean them very well. So if they've been in floodwaters and they may have sewage and pesticides, your child may have to lose that animal. So try to do your best to clean, but also recognize you are going to have to get rid of some things. Right. And from an agricultural perspective, too, we've talked about this in the past. If floodwaters touch any crop, any produce that you're going to eat, that's contaminated and you can't eat that anymore. It's no good. If uh, even even hay, right, we talked about you know, having hay submerged in flood water, well, that now causes a major problem in mold and that hay is ruined. If it's been, if it sits in flood water and that it just wicks up all that, all that moisture and all that dirt in there, it's not going to be good for the livestock. Yeah. And then you're looking at potential mycotoxins too. Exactly. Yeah. And, and plus outside of flooding, even Sometimes when you talk about, hey, when you do a forage analysis, one of the things you see is ash content. And ash content is essentially dirt that's in there. And if you have an ash content of 10%, well, that's 10% of that feed that's going into that animal's rumen is going to be dirt. And dirt in the rumen is not very good. So just imagine like how much ash and how much dirt gets collected when you have that flood water in there. And it's just unhealthy for the animal. It's potentially toxic hay. You just don't want to just stay away from it. It's not anything that you want to keep feeding to your animals. Um, You're not going to get ahead by utilizing that. Right. And you also want to consider that hay does act like a sponge, just like your insulation. And it's going to pull the moisture up from the soil 
and all the way up through the stack. So even if it was protected from rain from above, if it flooded, that whole stack is probably unfortunately not unusable. So you can take off the top bales and see if they're dry, but if they're wet, you can worry about mycotoxin development and also fire potential because wet hay, it will start to decompose and build up heat and could potentially be a fire hazard. So you want to get the hay out of the barn and spread it out so that it is not going to cause the barn to burn. Yeah, that's right. When hay dries, it becomes stable. And all those microbes basically become inert and you don't have energy. When it's wet again, it just reactivates everything. They're going to start breaking down nutrients. They're going to create heat and heat leads to fires. So another major problem when you're talking about floodwaters touching agricultural products like hay. But again, if any kind of floodwaters touch produce, it's just so dirty that it becomes inedible. Please stay away from it. Yeah, and also make sure if you did lose crops or hay that you're reaching out to your local FSA office to see what type of emergency uh, recompense is available. And also if you have seed, like let's say you have seed grain that you were going to put out, that is probably not going to be able to be salvaged unless you're planting it like right now. Even if you dry seed out, it probably isn't going to stop it from germinating since it has had that opportunity to absorb that water or imbibe the water and expand and it wants to germinate now. So that seed, again, is probably a loss unless you can get it planted out quickly. But planting wet seed, especially with a mechanical planter, is going to be a nightmare. Yeah, but let's let's kind of get away from the, the farm aspect of flood damage. And even, you know, in the cities and just people that have trees, like this was one thing that you always talked about in the past. When you, With winds and rain, typically you have down trees, you have broken branches, right? Keep your eye out for that kind of thing. And make sure that you're being safe as far as removing branches. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to cut down any trees, that might be potential danger. If you're not experienced enough to remove a tree that looks like it might fall on your house, call, call a professional because things become very unstable in that kind of environment where trunks are split and branches are broken. Look up and, <laughs> and just be aware. Right. And that's a really great point because after a storm is when all of the amateur chainsaw users come out and we get a lot of injuries from those as well. So make sure you have proper equipment, including leg chaps or ripstop pants, because you don't need to create a new uh, emergency. Like I said, a lot of the injuries follow the storm. So... 911's already busy, don't make them busier. Make sure you have your safety goggles, your hard hat, your ear protection, your leg protection, oh, yeah. your gloves, good solid boots. And also, if you don't know how to use a chainsaw, let someone else do it. It's, it's really easy to send yourself to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Not the best time to learn how to use a chainsaw. No, no. So one of the things you see after storm damage is branches that are only partially attached. And those branches have a lot of tension on them created by the wood that's used to being in another position. So if you go to cut it, it could snap up in your face very quickly. So you don't want to Try to cut tension wood straight down. You can shave it a little from underneath to try to lessen the tension and release some of that stored energy so that it doesn't crack into you. But again, if you aren't experienced in cutting these types of limbs, it's not recommended to try to do so right after an emergency. Yeah. Well, Karen, even if it's not broken, even if you just have a limb there, but like obviously limbs don't stick straight out, you know, there's there's tension at the attachment point. So if you're cutting any kind of limb, it'll jump. Yeah. It'll fly different directions. And 
That's why it's so important to make sure you're wearing goggles. Even if it's, even if you're not getting hit with like a large limb, if you're like, Oh, I'm cutting these, you know, I'm, I'm cutting these small branches, but guess what? A little twig in your eye can do a lot of damage. So just be aware. Sawdust in your eye can do a lot of damage. You know, eyes are super sensitive. Yeah, but limbs can fly whether whether they're broken or not. Like I've seen them fly just because there's always that tension. I mean, how you know if you're if you're holding a if you're holding a weight out and you can only hold your arm out for so long before it gets tired. There's a lot of energy in that attachment point, and once you cut that, it releases it, like Karen was saying, and then it flies. So before we run out of time, I want to go over some basic chainsaw safety, because I know some of you are going to be out there with a chainsaw. (laughs) Always know how to use your chainsaw. And these there's a great list on uh, University of Florida's website for gardening solutions under cleaning up after a hurricane. So always read and follow the instruction manual. I know some of you are really against reading instruction manuals, but it's important. Never drop start a chainsaw. Make sure your chainsaw is safely on the ground when you're pull starting it. Make sure when you're buying a saw, you use a low kickback chain. It should have a good solid hand guard and a chain break. Those should all be functioning properly before you use the saw. Wear your protective equipment, like we said. Keep both hands on the chainsaw at all times. No one-handed chainsawing. I don't care how small your saw is, no one-handed chainsawing. You should always cut at your waist level or below. Um, Cutting above your heads is going to give you head injury. Cut away from your body, never towards it. Uh, You need to push the saw away from you when you're making a cut. You should never be pulling it. Kickback uh, is one of the easiest ways to get hurt. And so you should know what kickbacks are out there, uh, what your saw could do. If the upper tip of the saw blade contacts an object, it can cause the saw to come straight back at you. And you won't have time to react because that saw is going a lot faster than your reaction speed. Yes. So to avoid, never cut with the upper tip of the saw. You should cut with the part of the blade that is closest to the engine and watch the tip of the saw at all times so it makes sure it doesn't come into contact with another branch or something else. And always start the saw before you get to the branch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The saw should be started, like I said, on the ground, not by drop starting it. Also, make sure that if someone else is using a chainsaw and you need to go talk to them, make sure they know you're there. A lot of times they can't hear you. So don't approach someone using a chainsaw unless you know they know you're there. If like they're cutting a limb and you think it's going to fall into a power line or something, um, maybe like toss a rock at them or something <laughs> because you don't want that to fall on you. And take your time, do the job right, take lots of breaks. You're already stressed after a storm and fatigue is the leading cause of injury in a lot of different careers and in using a chainsaw. So once you're tired, stop. And and another thing is chainsaws come in all sizes. I'm not gonna, they, they're all about the same shape, but they come in all sizes, right? <laughs> and and the, the, there's a saw for a certain job. Yeah. So make sure you are utilizing the proper size saw for the job at hand, because that's when it's like it's it's you're not using the chainsaw properly for that job and injuries can happen that way very easily. That's very true. And when in doubt, call a professional. It's worth it to save your life and save you a trip to the hospital, especially if you're trying to clean up after a storm and you've got 100,000 things to do and you have a family to protect and to care for. So don't put yourself in the hospital. Yeah. And where where the safety chaps, too, because you're going to be thinking about a million things after you're done cutting that you saw might not stop right away. And, you know, you might be just readjusting your arms the saw might hit your leg. Just wear those safety chaps, wear all the safety equipment that is appropriate for that job. 
but the safety chap really going to save your life. And again, be extra cautious when cutting bent or twisted limbs. If they're caught under something or they're just abnormally stressed, they can snap back and can kill you. So do be careful with that. So we covered dirty floodwaters, chainsaw safety, checking in on your neighbors, checking in on your family, stay away from down wires, just understand that you're in a dirty environment when it floods. And there's there's lots of dangers there that you normally don't think about. So be extra aware when you are outside and make sure that you are not wearing open shoes, shorts. Um, you know, that's the time to wear the boots, pants, long sleeves, gloves. Just make sure you're being extra cautious because when emergency management's tapped out, it becomes even a bigger risk. Yeah, definitely. And stay hydrated. And so take care of yourself. I hope that you never have to use this information, but we wanted to provide it just in case. And if you have or any questions, reach out to your local extension office, um, work with your emergency management system and stay safe. Thanks for listening to Extension Calling. This show is a collaboration between OSU Belmont County Extension Educator Dan Lima and WVU Ohio County Extension Agent Karen Cox. If you'd like a transcript of this show, contact us at the office. Also, let us know if you enjoy the show by ranking us on your podcast app.